Oh, there we go. All right. Uh, well, hello there, everybody. Ooh. It's all chilly outside. Uh, but I'm glad you could join me. Today is... The 16th of January, 2021. It is 7.34 CST PM. And we are starting episode 12 of Cast Talks. Today's mostly going to be talking about video games of the past. Games that I was really into when I was younger. Games that I played when I was uh, just a... Just a little bean. Just a little boy. Uh, but we're going to start with some good news. So to begin with, I'd like to welcome all of you to Cast Talks. And I'd also like to say, we're glad to have you. And we're glad to be hanging out again for our 12th week in a row. Also, <laughs> hey Eli. Also, we have been active for more than three months. Can you believe that? It'll be our three month anniversary here very, very soon. Actually, yeah, it's been it's more than three months. It's been more than three months. It all started October thirty first. Halloween. Have you seen the Halloween episode, Ella? It is crazy though, I agree. Yeah, the Halloween episode of Cast Talks, yeah. I answered a bunch of Halloween questions on that one. Hey, it was a, it was a good stream. Almost nobody was there, uh, but it was a good stream. Sort of the, the start of all nice. So, here's our first good news story of the day. <laughs> we did talk about candy, I remember that. A third year English design student has quite simply attached a four layer air purifier to a bicycle wheel allowing cyclists to clean the air pollution in any city where they pedal. Carl Rolle. Rollo, yeah, Rollo. The filter could purify more than a quarter million square meters of air if merely 10% of London cyclists fitted it to their front wheel. Armed with the basic understanding that pedaling a bicycle creates kinetic energy, all tapping was required to do. All tapping was required to do to make her dream a reality was find a way to channel dirty air in one side and expel clean air out the other. Existing filtration technology already used fans and turbines to force air through filters, similar to a bike wheel. After she had finished the final design, she fitted a four layer filter of activated carbon washable HEPA and LUFA to clean small particles as well as noxious gases like CO2, NO2, and ground ozone. With a basic yet eye-catching design, Rollo is rolling out with all the infrastructure it needs to make replacing the filters sustainable. Through a pickup mail and service, Used filters are sent back to Rollo for washing while clean filters are swapped in, explains the designer on her website. Rollo won Kristen Tapping, the 2020 Design Innovation in Plastics Award, and it's now being readied for a massive market launch in 2022. No word yet on how much it will cost. She wants to reward people who cycle the most often with cleaning credits, a companion app would track cycling data, allow you to set goals and keep track of your credits, 
and she hopes to convince local restaurants or shops to accept Rolo credits as a form of reward points. Finally, the Rolo can be made in bulk through simple injection molding and a 3D printer, while the filters will be recycled at the end of their lifespan. It seems like the perfect product for the circular economy. Ah, that's amazing. Uh, I am astounded by the things people come up with. That's our first news story for today. It's a good one. Okay, so. Now that we're a bit warmed up with some good news, with some wholesomeness, we're talking about video games. So. I know that video games are really uh, crazily important in our culture these days. Not only that, but they have a huge impact on basically everything that goes on. And so it is natural, I think, to have played one as a young man in the United States. So. I will here describe a few things that I was really interested in when I was very young. I'm talking like maybe four or five years old here. That's how young I was when I started gaming, I guess you could say. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I started with a game called Pajama Sam. At least that's the first one I could remember. That and Freddy Fish. Freddy Fish was a series of like mini games and an adventure game on top of it all is the shell story. It was very similar uh, to Pajama Sam in that way. There was a shell story and a series of mini games that connected everything together. And I was quite uh, enthralled, I guess you could say, by the way that Pajama Sam and Freddy Fish were uh, put together. There were games that really encapsulated a lot of my feelings about animation and comedy and it really crystallized a lot of my interest in that medium that medium of pointing and clicking to begin with and typing in answers and playing go fish in spy fox with that uh, really fun to watch get stressed out cat if you know what i'm talking about uh, it's <laughs> it's really something and just young me, young, young me, almost didn't know what to do with all that sensory overload. Just so much going on on screen, you know? But I craved it. I craved more and more of it as time went on. And I think the next game my parents introduced me to was StarCraft II. Or was it StarCraft? Brood War. StarCraft Brood War. That was the one. And I have never been good at StarCraft. Uh, I am a competent player at best, but I just like looking at the animations so much. You know, I can never really peel myself away from admiring the way the game looks long enough to actually play it. <laughs> I find myself completely enthralled just to sit and watch all the little characters go about their business and do their chores and tasks to the point where my brother would always defeat me. So would my parents and my sister. And, you know, there was not much I could do about it because I, I just enjoyed watching all the stuff happen. And I was, I was a poor loser, to be fair. I was a poor loser. I cried almost every time that I lost. Uh, I remember that very well. But I hope that all of you there at home are relaxing someplace cozy with uh, maybe some tea or a snack. If you can stand the crinkling of a aluminum bag. Which I can only tolerate some days. But either way, I think that when I was much, much younger, something that I was really interested in was uh, 
I, I didn't get into console gaming until I was about until I was in uh, until I moved to my second home. But I was very into playing with action figures and particularly GI Joes. I remember that. And it was video games, Legos, and that. I was never really a uh, I was never really a Play-Doh kind of kid. I didn't like the smell of it. Though, it does smell good. I didn't like it, <laughs> at the time at least. But I remember my parents introduced me to Diablo 2 soon after StarCraft. And I remember very well the first character I played. I played a druid that was the first class. I played that class and I had no idea what I was doing. I just liked the way the dude looked, and so I wanted to play him. And, you know, I learned that you could have a little creep vine that would follow you around and make vines on the ground. And I was like, oh, that's cute. That's really cool. Uh, and I, you know, clicked and fought monsters and stuff like that. And to this day, I think about it. And maybe sometime soon, I'll be playing a lovely little little game of Diablo as a barbarian. That would be fun. Plus, I could click a lot and not have to do much else, which would be helpful to my hand issues. Clicking seems to be much easier for me than typing. But who knows? And I think that it was when I was really, really starting to get into video games for the first time, right? I was really uh, interested, interested in figuring out what was going on. Oh, you know, I've almost forgotten. I hope that you're doing well, Ella. I hope you're having a lovely day. I know we haven't spoken in a little while. But I hope you're doing all right. I think that something I really enjoyed was uh, a game that came right after it was only released doing very well thank you I hope you are as well I'm I'm doing much better than I was earlier I was so emotional earlier on today I was speaking with a friend and she gave me some advice and the advice uh, hit me hard and I think there was a lot of usefulness to the advice but it still hit me very hard I was in a, in a mood for quite some time for quite some time. But yeah, I think that there was definitely a, a difficulty I faced in figuring out how to play video games, right? Because, oh, Ella, I hope that you enjoy the background. I spent a bit of time working on this one just so I could have something of my own to show. I, thank you, thank you. I am feeling better. I I had a bit of time that needed to be taken to, to feel sad. Uh, and it was bad for a little while, but I got through it. So, But thank you very much. I made this background in Tabletop Simulator. And it's the first one of these that I'm using, really. I, I have a few of these that I have constructed for various things. And this one I made just for the stream. I can't make the fire flicker, unfortunately. But it does look very nice, I think. And I'm enjoying the fruit of it, of actually using it. Though it's a bit barren, unfortunately. It could use a little bit more, uh, a little more things added to it. I'm glad you think so. It took me a little while to get everything just right. But it, it certainly is something I can use, right? I can use this whenever I want to. No worries about copyright here. I'm enjoying that feeling. Really, I am. What games did you play when you were younger? Or have you ever been much into gaming, Ella? I've just been so excited to even talk about it. I've barely been interacting. It's my fault.
Taking a trip down memory lane can do that to you, though. Not really a gamer, to be honest. I had a, wi a Wii that I occasionally play on, but other than that, eh, that and SL, nothing. Yeah, I see what you mean. Second Life is certainly a game of its own, but the Wii, I've never actually used a Wii before or held a Wii mode. I think that it's a pretty cool idea for a console. It's kind of the first of its kind, but it never really stuck out to me, and my family could really only afford, like, one console every now and again, every few years. And my first console was the PS2, the PlayStation 2. And I had some games on there that I remember very well. Oh, man. But we'll get to that. The next game that I remember was a game called, uh, it was called Star Trek Elite Force. It was a game, oh, Star Trek Voyager Elite Force, excuse me. Now that was a game, and I think Nerd Cubed has made a little playlist of him playing it. Uh, and seriously, it is a very fun game. There's even a second one, which isn't nearly as good as the first, but the first one is very good. It's a very good game. If it was only that, if that was the only Star Trek for Voyager, it would be standalone and good. It would it would do just fine on its own. Uh, but it has a lot of the good stuff in it that you can expect from a Star Trek game. You know, jargon and mumbo jumbo and good weapons and cool fighting. And the Borg are in it as well, which one of my favorite races in Star Trek. Another thing I really like about it is that it was a very uh, good first-person shooter on top of being a good Star Trek game. It got both of those worlds right, and it won me over. Not to mention, my family was uh, high in the PvP, the online PvP. I remember watching Star Trek when I was younger. Do you have a favorite Star Trek out of all of them? You don't remember the show, okay. I I understand how that can be, because there's a lot of it. And there's not only a lot of it, there's a lot of different stuff from it, too. So it makes sense. I think that a lot of people not only feel like they can scarcely remember one episode in completion, but also they can't remember any of the characters or any of the plot points really significantly. Certainly, though, I have some favorites myself. I think that uh, Deep Space Nine is probably my favorite. A little better than uh, Next Generation. Certainly better than Voyager and uh, Enterprise. And I, I just never really got into the original series myself. Never got into it. I think it's not bad, though. As far as video games go, though, Elite Force was just a classic. It was a classic. I remember being really, really into it. And I was, a, I was having a lot of fun with it for a long time. Now, let's see, what was the next game I played? The next game I played was... Uh, let's see, Elite Force. We'll skip a few until we can remember some more. I remember playing those uh, console games, like I mentioned before. I remember playing <laughs> Coliseum Road to Freedom. That was a great game. And replaying it almost... 20 years later, no, almost 15 years later, I finally figured out that there's a gore setting. After 15 years, I could barely, scarcely believe that I had not figured out there was an extra option in the menu for that. 
Of course, it was turned off to begin with, though, because it's very gory, very uh, messy, and that would have given it a much higher rating if it was on uh, completely from the start. But it was fun. It was very fun. I I might stop my copy somewhere around the around the house. But yes, that was a personal favorite of mine. Another good one was, let's see, I have actually sold most of my PS2 games at this point, which is a shame because there are so many good ones. Oh, I remember, uh, Genji, Dawn of the Samurai, that's a good one. Uh, Genji was a game where you played as a samurai with two swords, and you were avenging your father after he was slain, and... Uh, you had these orbs, these orbs that let you slow down time. And there was this girl who could mix the orbs, and she turned them into a bigger orb. And there was this other dude who was like, I'm going to steal her and make the biggest orb of all that lets, lets me slow down time and turn into a god. And that was the main villain of the game. I remember that. The last fight was so hard because it was so based on timing that you had to be at like six times slow motion to even parry him properly. And I have this save right at the end of the game where I'm like trying to fight him so hard, but I just can't beat him. And it just haunts me to this day that I'm so close to the end of that game, but I never actually finished it. <laughs> I remember that really well. Uh, Genji was, was a great game. Great game. Good bosses, too. Really good bosses. You got to choose his two different characters, uh, and one of them is like a big old monk with a gigantic uh, drum staff, almost. Yeah, it's a good game. Let's see, let's take another one. Resident Evil 4. So I played Resident Evil 4 when I was very young. PS2, Resident Evil 4, oh my gosh. I remember so well loading up the game and being thrilled to try it. But I only got as far as the village on my first attempt because I was so scared. I was so scared of playing it that I just, I couldn't do it. You know, I was scared of the, the villagers and stuff. It took me a long time to ever actually get good at the game and face my fears uh, but that was uh, that was a different time you know I was a much younger lad and I was uh, easily frightened by the idea of scary things in a video game I think at that age though and I was only like maybe 11 at that age it's very easy to be scared by things it wasn't another game I played. There was this big old monitor, this big old TV, an old TV that used to be in the room I lived in. And I remember that it always flickered a little bit here and there. <sighs> that was lovely. Something else that I remember as well. I had a really great time playing things like... Uh, what was it called? I'll get back to it later. I had a really great time playing games like Left 4 Dead when it came out a little later. Left 4 Dead, I, 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 I'm sure any of you have heard it, it's just a shooter. Uh, apocalypse shooter, and I really enjoyed the way that, you know, crowds of enemies would come after you and you'd have to, you'd have to defend yourself with your gun. And that was really fun. <laughs> it's a very arcade shooter, almost. I remember I, the first time I played it, I was so into it. And the commercials for it, too, were really great. It really sucked you in. There was even a versus mode where you could play as the uh, 
special enemies. Ah, uh, those were the times. The first time you got your hand on a video game. It's a crazy, crazy feeling. Crazy feeling. was a good one from there as well. <laughs> Spore. I just remembered Spore exists. Yeah, Spore was a game that everybody was hyped about. Everyone was like, this is going to be the new hotness. It's going to set the standard for games for here, from forever, basically. Uh, and it was supposed to be a game where you could go from the complexity of a single cell organism to that of a galaxy ruling empire and yes yeah, more yeah uh, if you've seen any of the early demonstrations of it it's just this like tiny dot that moves around and gets other dots and that was what it was supposed to be to start with but it got very cartoonized uh, infantilized almost uh, for the sake of being accessible to everybody is what some people think and Certainly, the quality of the game didn't match up to what it was promised to be. At least I believe so, but I think that the game was rushed a bit as well. I remember feeling so hyped about it. I was so hyped to play it. I remember when we got home and I opened the, the packaging. I was thinking about what, what creature I would make to begin with. And I don't remember my first creature. But what I do remember is that... I, I never really got very far. Just far enough to be interested in, like, playing a little bit. But never far enough to beat the game, certainly. My brother beat the game, though. And I watched the ending cutscene with him and my family... And we were all a little disappointed, to be honest with you, but, you know, that's how it goes. That's how it goes. What are some other games? Oh, I remember the game that I played after. I, I remember the game I played after. I played Elite Force. Uh, it was a game called Star Wars uh, Jedi Outcast. Uh, Jedi Outcast was certainly an interesting game. It was the first game that lets you use like a lightsaber as a weapon that was like a sword almost, as opposed to just a you click a button and it plays an animation. No, you you could swing it and block and defend yourself and almost fence with it. Though it was very rudimentary, it was still you could do it and you could like cut people up and stuff like that. And it was. It's a little gory, my bad. But it was an interesting thing. It's an interesting idea for a video game. And it has sequel, uh, Jedi Academy. And that was a, an interesting one. Honestly, they had a lot going for it. You know, you're playing as your own character, uh, becoming a Jedi, or being evil if you'd like to. And... There was a lot to like about it, honestly. A lot to like. The first time I really ever got into like light tubers and stuff like that. What was the next one? We'll get back to it. Let's see. Another PS2 game. Another PS2 game. Shadow of the Colossus is one I played for a little while. I remember being really into that game and thinking it was like super cool and interesting and I I just <laughs> I wanted so badly to beat it at some point that I I got obsessed with it like and I have gotten obsessed with many video games in the past I think that honestly I have a uh, an interesting relationship with video games because for the most part, I don't think I am 
good at playing them in moderation. I certainly didn't know how to play them in moderation to begin with. I was very... What's the word for it? I was very late when it came to learning to moderate my impulses and behaviors. To the point where I almost didn't end up doing it ever. And I had to really learn what it was like to have some control over yourself. Because, oh man, I, I just didn't get it, honestly. I didn't get it for such a long time that I had to had to struggle and work twice as hard as everybody else, three times as hard, just to control myself and not binge a video game for, well, six hours at a time, really. And I certainly had a bad, had a bad, uh, maybe the word is, A bad start with it, but I just enjoy them so much. You know, I enjoyed video games so much that that I I couldn't help it. You know, I couldn't help but be interested. I couldn't help but get into it. And before I knew it, I was just you know staying up late. Not eating, not sleeping, not drinking water, just playing video games for hours and hours and hours. And I do think that that fundamentally flawed my physique for uh, maybe even to this day, uh, not getting enough exercise and not having proper posture or nutrition, things like that. It did stunt me to some degree, and I still suffer from that, but... Hey, you know, I have good times. But on top of that, there were other games too that I really enjoyed. I I did beat Shadow of the Colossus at some point. Uh, with the ending, you know, I always thought it was sad that you didn't get to hang out with your girlfriend at the end or your wh whoever that was at the end. That's what I thought it was. <laughs> Maybe it was uh, a projected wishful thinking of mine. But I'm sure a lot of other people thought that too. I was very interested in, in getting a girlfriend to the point. But uh, honestly, I think my thoughts were dwelling on the opposite sex uh, in, in matters of loneliness, but also in matters of attraction, which is natural for a young man. I just remember very clearly wishing that the main character had survived. I don't mean to spoil the game for you, but uh, it's quite old now. I think I'm, I think I'm free to do so. And for a long time, and to this day, I have watched things called Let's Plays, where you watch somebody else play the game while you sit back and relax. And it does relax me quite a bit. It makes me feel very... Uh, what's the word for it? makes me feel very safe and comfortable sort of with somebody else in charge doing something instead of me that was the sort of thing I came in, I went in for but yeah I was really into that. Not only that, but I was really into... Internet games, too. Like Flash games. I got into Flash games pretty hard when I was young. Uh, maybe about... seven or eight you know a very young age when flash games are only just uh, starting to exist for the first time 
And I remember feeling like there was nothing cooler on this planet than a Flash game. <laughs> Just getting so wound up and hyped up for them. I think I've lost a lot of that uh, childhood hype that I had. Most of the time, I don't quite have that same thought for video games like I used to. It's kind of just a, it's a passing thought of, you know, oh, I'll just, some other time, I'll think about it or do something about it. But now it's not what it used to be. Certainly, though, a video game could capture my interest and make me want to play it again. certainly possible there just haven't been that many games that have interested me not for some time either way though there are lots of games to choose from these days and I think when I was younger, I went in for the the easiest to choose ones that you could think of, like the first person shooters or the really basic ones, the vanilla ones. And I am a big fan of Might and Magic. <laughs> I remember playing those games when I was really young. I don't know if I played them after I played I, I played them after Diablo 2, but I still remember really enjoying them. I remember that I was always playing with my dad, who played, I, he always called himself Vax Hack. I don't know why he chose that name. But certainly there was a lot going on. There was always this dynamic of I was the student and he was the master and I learned how to play video games from him. I remember that. I would just sit in a chair next to him or on his lap, maybe when I was younger, and he would play video games and I would just sit there and watch. I was always happy with that. It's a memory I don't think about as often as I should. It's quite, it's quite nice. Another video game that I remember fondly, I think it was called... I remember looking at it and playing it, but not the name, unfortunately. I did play The Sims at one point, but I was never really a fan of The Sims. Another uh, very cartoonish game. Let's see, what else was there? Oh, I remember Spider-Man. The little Spider-Man games that came out back when the first movie came out. I was only, I was only five when that movie came out. Gosh. I was only five. Or was I younger? I don't remember now. I was very young, though. Very, very young. And there was always a Spider-Man game coming out. I remember in this Spider-Man game, there was a big old cage match where it was like a horde mode where the guys would just keep coming until you beat the last one, which was real difficult because you only had one health bar. And the thing my sister used to do is she would hang from the top Yeah, I got started. I say my note. So many people are obsessed with The Sims. I got started, but quickly was over it. Me too. I played The Sims for like a short time, and I was like, oh, I see what this is. Well, I'm done. I think I remember my dad saying, I'll buy you The Sims, but I will not buy you any of the expansions. And I was like, that's fine. I'll either like the base game or I won't, you know? It's as simple as that. What game was it talking about? 
I, I remember though. There was always like a, a an understanding between me and uh, my father that I, you know, would just sit around and watch him play stuff and enjoy myself, and then he would uh, teach me a thing or two, and he would help me become a better gamer, I guess you could say. And when he and I played Might and Magic together. I remember uh, the sounds of the game really well. The game had such memorable sounds. The sound of a turn passing, combat starting. The sound of... Uh, oh, I can scarcely remember what it even was. I remember we played one of them together. I don't remember if it was Mandate of Heaven or if it was 4 or 5, but it was one of them. And I remember the little faces moving whenever something would happen and you know they would move and react and stuff like that I remember that so well those are good memories on top of that though I remember that when I was really young I used to I used to be so interested in, in like, in sandbox games, that's what it was. I was really interested in sandbox games. In fact, I was so interested that I scarcely even remembered doing anything at all besides that. You know, I would play a sandbox game and I would be just so enthralled by it you know, I would have so much going on in my mind at the same time. I was just so into it, though. I was so into video games for such a long time. was I up to? I remember <laughs> the Matrix, uh, what was it called? The Matrix, Enter the Matrix, that was a, gosh, that was a game that was not very good. <laughs> Looking back on it now, seeing videos of it, I'm like, wow, I can't believe I liked that so much. <laughs> but I, I was into it, I was really into the Matrix when I was, when it first came out, because I was only like six when you know, I watched it and as a six-year-old watching the matrix is it's you're too young to watch it really you are too young to watch it but uh it was hitting on all gears it was on as on it was firing on all cylinders like it was hitting me hard and not just being a good movie but being a good movie when you're really young and when you don't understand how good it is, but you just know that it's really good. There is something special about that, which I appreciate, but I don't think it's worth seeing the other movies that I saw when I was too young. I don't think it's worth it. Let's see what other games were there. <laughs> Grand Theft Auto San Andreas and Grand Theft Auto 3. Wait, Grand Theft Auto 2. Yeah, where you played as Tony, right? Tony. Tony something. Not Soprano, but. You, uh. I mean, everybody's heard of Grand Theft Auto. And I remember my sister playing it and me thinking that I was completely uh, shocked that you could run around and shoot people whenever you wanted to. I I didn't even get why you would want to, but, you know, I guess there's an instinct in every person who plays video games to just run around and, and shoot as many people as they can. But that's what you do when you're really young, is you 
sometimes don't <laughs> have the same control over just going off on, on sprees that you might have when you're older. Because now I don't think I would care about doing that. I've sort of gotten over that. I do remember, though, that I really, I really enjoyed the little uh, adventure games, too, that I would play with my sister and brother. I, I'm not very good at adventure games, though. Point-and-click adventure games, specifically. Uh, the puzzles always elude me. I'm never able to think that kind of abstractly. My lateral thinking is quite good, but my abstract thinking is uh, not so good, unfortunately. I remember that I was really into watching my father play Diablo as well because he used to always have so many builds he was doing so many different things he was he was trying to do It feels like a long, long time ago, honestly. But I remember it pretty well. Though my memory isn't very good, to be honest. Oh, it was Shadow of the Colossus is what I was thinking about. Yeah, I never got any of the upgrades or did any of the special uh, challenges. I just played the game normally and happened to beat it without upgrading anything or doing anything. And I was always like, wait, there's upgrades? There's trees you can climb and fruit you can eat and swords you can get? I was like, what? I didn't know this. Why didn't I know this? And I didn't know that until like a few years ago. Uh, I can barely believe, I can scarcely believe that I got so far in the game without any help and I just assumed that was what it was supposed to be. <laughs> Man, what a time though. What a time. crazy. <laughs> I've been meaning to have this video game episode for a while though. Because I've played so many of them. So, so many of them. I remember Age of Empires too. My brother and I played that together. It 
and me and my family would try to beat the computer at uh, StarCraft and stuff like that. <laughs> Which is very difficult to do. But I remember it pretty well. All right, folks, we're coming to the halfway point. And what you should do is you should stand up, stretch a little bit, go to the bathroom, and meet me back here in five minutes. Because that's what I'm doing. I'm going to take a little stretch, take a little walk, and I'll be back before you know it. So go ahead and just take a little short break. Meet me back here in five, and I'll see you in just a little bit. Be right back.
All right, here I am. Back as promised. <sighs> well, I hope you all had a lovely little stretch. Or a lovely little whatever you decided to do. Thank you so much, and welcome back to you, Ella, if you took your little time off. Uh, we are at the halfway point exactly, so it is time for our next good news segment. So here we go. The new green building revolution uses timber to build ply scrapers that save tons of CO2. Across, across the world, advancement in plywood technology is giving way to a slew of wooden skyscrapers aptly called ply scrapers. These innovative towers are beginning to top 200 feet with one ambitious project in Norway reaching 280 feet while also creating less carbon emissions and requiring less time to build. The secret to these ply scrapers' survival and success comes down to a new way to create plywood, and it involves laminating boards of wood together with glue at 90 degree angles before pressing them together under the immense pressure and steam, steam of industrial wood presses. This technology has changed the whole face of timber as a construction material, said Roma Agrawal, the structural engineer who built the Shard in central London, the Economic Times. It's a huge leap forward in terms of strength paired with massive advances in fire safety. The result known as cross-laminated timber, or CLT, is a part of a group of materials called mass timber and thanks to changes in building regulations and greater eye towards sustainability, they are now being used in ever larger construction projects. Buildings like the Terrace House in Vancouver, 19 stories, the Ho Ho in Vienna, 24 stories, the Ascent in Milwaukee, 25 stories, and the Mistornet in Norway, the tallest wooden tower in the world, wouldn't be possible without CLT and mass timber technology. However, while the thought of cutting down enough trees to replicate a famous skyline seems ridiculous, ridiculously climate negative, considering the loss of carbon sequestration, the reality is that there are stages in the life of a tree where they become carbon emitters rather than carbon trappers. Carbon Capturing Construction Trees don't always store carbon, and they don't always suck up more carbon than they emit. Natural storms can uproot trees, exposing the precious carbon sequestering roots to decay. Death by fire, disease, age, damage, or any other way causes a tree to lose lots of its sequestered carbon and produce more still from the fungi that break, da break it down through the process of decomposition. But when a tree reaches a certain age, it will have indeed sucked up a lot of carbon. By turning that tree into mass timber, the carbon cannot escape through the natural processes, effectively making timber towers uh, prisons, with carbon dioxide as the inmates. <laughs> Trees store carbon, so if you harvest them at the right age, when they can't absorb much more or grow much further, then it's better of a solution to use them as building material, says Vol Architecture Oystein Eggsglass. Part of the team that built the Morstarnet Tower in Norway. In the video call with CNN, Elgles, Elgses expands on the idea by adding that it prolongs the tree's lifespan by preventing their decomposition by maybe 100 or 200 years if done correctly. The international building codes used by many countries as a base of their, for their own local building regulators 
regulations have just recently allowed for the creation of wooden buildings to reach 18 stories. While 18 story wooden buildings haven't existed in modern times, it remains to be seen if planned towers such as Sum Sumitomo Forestries Y3 or W350, a timber tower stretching 1,189 feet in the air, or London's Oakwood Timber Tower, slightly shorter, at just under a thousand feet, will ever be made based on current building regulations. But new research in fire resistance, strength, and other aspects that would have politicians and regulators raising eyebrows at CLT and mass timber construction, as well as a flood of market support and falling prices for mass timber, paints a picture of culture, of a culture of timber tower construction that's preparing to catch fire in architectural firms around the globe. That one was okay. I didn't know about that. Gigantic buildings, though, that you could make out of timber. So that's news to me. It's good news, though. And I'm always happy for them. Well, uh, I do hope that you're enjoying the stream so far. I know it's a bit quiet today, but we do get these quiet streams every now and again. But I'm glad that you're here. Now back to video games. I think that the most memorable video game thing that's happened to me is actually involving Diablo 2. In Diablo 2, when I first saw the uh, opening screen where the characters are standing beside the fire pit and they uh, when you click on them or mouse over them, they do their little stance, and then they uh, give you the introduction to them. I don't think as long as I live, I'll ever forget about that particular uh, character selection screen. That might be the most memorable thing I've ever seen in a video game. And it does make me feel better just seeing it, thinking about what's, what is lying ahead and what's to come. does make me feel a little bit safer thinking about the starting of a new character. I've been through quite a few video games in my time. Quite a few.
some games that have really left an impact on me throughout the years. Maybe I'd have to say The Witcher is one of them. The first one especially, I really liked. It's ugly. It's a very ugly game. <laughs> but it is very fun. It has a has a a special quality to it that I really enjoy. The second one's really good too, and so is the third one. I don't know which one I prefer. They're all uh, pretty good in my opinion. But I suppose I've bid farewell to most of that life. At least for as long as I can imagine. Because I'm not doing it anymore. You know, it's not good for my for my hands or for my mind like it used to be. Or maybe it never was, I don't know. I'm thinking about if the name of this stream was changed to Cast Toxy to Sleep, how that would change uh, the attendance rating, or how many more eyes it would get on it. I'm not certain I know. I would like to stream more on YouTube as well. I'm a little tired. <laughs> I have been more tired this week, though, than uh, in quite some time. I'm not sure why. considering what kind of other stuff I could be doing. I'm remembering something a friend told me about green texts. I think I'm going to give that a try next week, Ella. Let's see what happens. Though it's been pretty emotional for me today, so I may call this at a half stream as opposed to our normal two hours. I hope that uh, you've enjoyed yourself so far, everyone who's who's listening into this later on. But I am I, a little bit more tired today than I thought I would be. So we're gonna end the stream at about halfway point, a little after halfway. And I want to thank Ella for being here, because she's always here and always supporting me. And I want to thank the other person here, who I don't actually know what they are, who they are, but I'm grateful for them too. 
and I'm grateful for all of you guys watching on YouTube, watching on Twitch. Thank you very much for that. And as always, it's been great being here. And thanks for watching. See you next time.